the newest and the, the last, the final, the seventh covenant between God and mankind and between uh, the punishment that is deserving and about to fall down on humanity because of the breaking of the sixth covenant. And so we're in that final hour where Noah is calling the people uh, to board the the ark yeah. uh, before the flood hits. Yeah, because the, the hit is uh, sudden, right? The... It is sudden. How are you, Tiffany? I'm good today. Thank you so much for asking. How are you doing? I'm good. Good to have you back. Thank you so much for having me here. So, Tiffany, today uh, we want to talk about uh, the concept of the divine covenant. What is a covenant? It's a word that appears a lot in the Old Testament, the Torah, in the Bible, and in the Quran. And there's not much talk about it. So we want to know what is it? And how many covenants were there? And uh, uh, how does that pertain to today and the world that we're living in? Okay, that sounds great. Yeah? Yeah, that's a very interesting topic. So the covenant, it first appears in the book of Genesis when God establishes a covenant with Adam. And uh, a covenant, it literally means like a deal or a, what would you, what would you say the definition of a covenant would be? Yeah, like a contract, contract, yeah, something like that, where there's like agreements on, on both parties, what they're going to do, and it has to be upheld, otherwise it's broken. Yeah. And so we have, God establishes a covenant with Adam. Um, and he gives him a couple commandments. He tells him things that he must do in exchange for things that God will do. Mm -hmm. So God promises to safeguard Adam. Mm -hmm. He chooses Adam from amongst all of creation. Uh, he appoints him in the story of the of the creation of Adam in the Quran, especially it's it's evident, mm -hmm. and it's also evident in the in the Old Testament in the Torah. Uh, God makes in the Quran that the angels prostrate to Adam. In the Old Testament, He teaches him the names of all things, and He makes him in charge of all of the animals and all of the creatures, and uh, He pretty much had said to Adam that He created all things for him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he gives him he gives him a commandment. And the commandment is to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Yes. And he gives him one thing that he forbids him from. He forbids him from approaching the tree of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Old Testament is the tree of good and evil, and the Quran is the tree of immortality or the tree of life. And so then there's this contract that's established. It's an understanding that takes place between God and between mankind. It's almost like God is, after he creates mankind, he literally tells Adam what it is that he created him for and what it is that he wants from him. Yeah. He wants him to be fruitful and to multiply and to not approach this tree. Yes. Adam, however, uh, disobeys God. Yeah. He becomes uh, weak. Uh, the, the devil whispers to Adam and tells him, you know, maybe there's benefit in actually doing this one thing that God told you not to do. If you eat from it, you might end up having superpowers or being like the angels and and living forever, yeah. being more like God. You should definitely do that. And Adam makes the big mistake of instead of obeying 
and listening to God, he listens to the devil and he eats from the tree. Yes. And so we find that Adam breaks the covenant with God because the unspoken underlying tenet, the basis, the foundation of any covenant is that man has to obey God and man takes God as his king or whatever it is that God says he has to do. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so Adam breaks it, but he halfway breaks it. So he breaks the first part, which is the forbidden, but he doesn't break the other part, which is to be fruitful and multiply. And it's extremely significant because this is this event of the establishment of a covenant and the breaking of the covenant, uh, this is what all of humanity opens up with. This is kind of like the first page of our history, our storybook. Yeah, it's true. Our, our story begins with this covenant agreement between... And Christianity, what do they call the breaking of the covenant? What do they call this act that oh, Adam... Oh, um, the sin. The original, original sin. sin, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so then what happens? Immediately after the breaking of the covenant, God brings down a punishment upon Adam. There's a penalty that must accompany any breaking of a deal with God. So the breaking of the contract with God, the act of disobedience, or the original sin. Sin equates to breaking of the covenant. Yes. And it, it requires that a punishment comes down. There has to be an effect uh, that takes place to this act. And what was the punishment that comes down upon Adam? They got banished from the garden, the garden of Eden. They had so to be Adam taken off. And Eve yes. and Satan, all three of them, they get kicked out of the garden. Yes. Adam, he begins to cry. He repents very sincerely. And God decides to reinstate in the covenant. He forgives him. And when God forgives somebody, it's as if nothing ever happened. So he reinstates um his covenant, the first covenant with Adam, mm -hmm. and Adam remains appointed by God. Um, in the Quran, though, he kind of goes from somebody who could have had the utmost determination in his obedience to God to somebody who the Quran says we did not find that he had determination. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't counted as one of the Ulil Azm prophets. He came down from that rank, yes. all right, which is a, a prophet that uh, bore a covenant and uh, was faithful and did not break it. Okay. Okay. So then what takes place? Uh, Adam fulfills his covenant with God. Yeah. He marries Eve. Um, he has children with Eve. Mm -hmm. Uh, Adam and Eve have many children. They teach them about God and they command them to be fruitful and multiply. And the story of humanity continues as such. Yes. Until uh, the children of Cain, uh, they fill the earth and the children of Adam also. Uh, but they start disobeying God and transgressing against God. Yeah. Um, there's lots of acts of violence that is taking place now because Cain, he murders, he commits the first murder on the planet. But this was actually not something that was outlined as a rule by God. So God, when we when we look at the, the, the first covenant rules, he never says, you shall not kill. He doesn't give this commandment. And the reason why is because uh, nobody had ever killed before. Yeah. Uh, so there's no point in establishing a law to outlaw something that's never even crossed the mind of the creature, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So then people continue to go along their business. There's crime that's taking place. There's violence. Uh, there's, you know, 
wars, and there's also the establishment of big cities. But they get to a point where they actually do start breaking uh, very much so the covenant of God by um, the rejection of the divinely appointed caliphs that were appointed by God. So uh, initially they, they accept Adam. Uh, afterwards they start rejecting the successors of Adam. And then they break the commandment of being fruitful and multiplying in some of the narrations of the Jews and the Christians we find um, a story which takes place in which the children of Cain uh, begin to notice that after a woman bears children her body becomes uh, unattractive uh, there's stretch marks from childbirth. Um, her body begins to break down. Uh, it's not as, as perfect as it once was. And so they invent a drink that they give to um, the women in order to prevent... It. Whenever they would drink this drink, it would cause them to be barren. They would not be able to become pregnant or have children. And so many of the women uh, drunk it, and they remained extremely attractive, but they would never be fruitful, and they would never multiply. Okay. And all of the men that were living at that time, they began to find the women that did have children uh, repulsive in their eyes, and okay. so they would not approach them. Okay, so, so bearing children became very difficult in that situation absolutely and so they took the commandment that God gave them and they threw it behind their back they disobeyed they there, there remained nothing anymore uh, between what God had asked them to do and what the people were doing okay. they were not listening to Adam's successors who was commanding them to be fruitful and multiplying and they were rejecting the commandment and the people who gave them that commandment. Okay. And so God decides that he's going to wipe out humanity. And he sends forward a prophet. His name's Noah. Yeah. And Noah remains for 950 years, uh, warning the people and telling them that uh, if you don't repent and go back on your ways, uh, something really bad's going to happen. God's going to uh, eliminate uh, all mankind. A punishment's going to come down. A flood's going to happen. Yeah. And then what takes place, Tiffany? So they build. He, God commands him to build this ark, in, in which he could survive this punishment, and he calls the people to to repent so that they could be a part of this. He would call people. And there was uh, this promise that when the tree would grow, then uh, then the punishment would come down. But over and over again, that didn't take place. So the people uh, fell off the truth. And then in the end, it was only Noah and his family that were saved. And they went aboard the ark and then the punishment came. And the people, you know, they were still going about their lives when that happened. And, and it just took them by surprise. The punishment came down. Okay. So what do we have now? We have a situation. God creates Adam and Eve. He gives them two commandments, basically. Mm -hmm. right? Be fruitful and multiply. Don't approach the tree. They break the first one. God uh, alleviates from them uh, that commandment and basically kicks them out. Now, they have, uh, now the tree's not even around them anymore for them to disobey or not mm -hmm. obey. Right? Mm -hmm. Or to disobey or obey. And now they have one commandment left. And that one commandment is to be fruitful and multiply. People reject it. Now there's nothing left of the covenant that's being fulfilled. God decides to send a prophet to warn them. People don't care. They fight the prophet. They attack the prophet. They disbelieve in the prophet. They mock the prophet. And now mankind at the 11th hour are split into two groups. Group A, which are a small group of believers, eight individuals with Noah that are holding firm to the covenant and that are keeping strong in their faith in God. Mm -hmm. 
and the rest of humanity, group B, that have totally broken and rejected the covenant. Yes. God decides to send the flood down. It wipes out everybody with the exception of those whom had basically kept their covenant. Those who had held tight to Noah. Yes. Yeah. The flood settles. Noah comes off the ark, him with the believers that are with him. And now God speaks to Noah and he says to him something fascinating. He says to him, now I'm going to establish a new covenant with you, Noah. Yeah. The old covenant, unfortunately, the people broke it. It is no more now. Now I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And so we see that there's a multiplicity in the covenants, that God has the willingness to reestablish his contract with mankind. When we examine the new covenant that God is establishing with Noah, we find that it still contains the old commandment, which is to be fruitful and multiply, but now there are additions to it. Yeah. Good. One of the additions to it is that God tells Noah, he gives him a new commandment and says that nobody's allowed to kill. Yes. Interesting, because that, that's born out of the previous situation, that, that murder didn't exist before, so it wasn't a part of the previous covenant. But now, since the people had invented it, and it had been happening, and killing had been happening, God didn't like that. And actually, it worked against the commandment to be fruitful and multiply, so he put this rule. That's cool. And he also grants Noah things that he didn't grant to Adam and the people that were living, uh, you know, between the time of Adam and Noah. He tells him that all of the greenery of the earth and the beasts of the earth have been made halal for you as food. They are permissible for you to eat. But he puts some restrictions. He says you can't eat something that's alive and you can't like uh, cut off limbs of a creature that's alive in order to eat it. You have to sacrifice it to God, and then you can eat that meat. Before Noah, the eating of meat was not there. Oh. It was only plants and greenery. And so the second covenant becomes greater in its laws and also uh, greater and richer in the things that like new blessings are coming down upon uh, no one is able to do things that before they weren't able to do. Okay. Okay? Yeah, interesting. So then what happens? So a second covenant now is established, and uh, Noah goes forward, and he teaches people to be pious. He warning people against murder. He's preaching peace. Um, he's telling people to sacrifice to God. Um, and he's teaching them to worship God and to be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. And the generations continue to follow after Noah. Noah becomes like the second Adam. Uh, Adam, it's only Adam and his family in the beginning, and they're filling the earth. Uh, second covenant, it's kind of like a restart button, and Noah becomes the more perfect Adam and the first of the uh, Ulil Azm prophets that actually keeps his covenant, uh, the first of the determined prophets that keep their covenant, and he, and he comes with a new sharia. Mm. So the jurisprudence that Noah now is coming with is different than the Adamic jurisprudence. Yes. And this is, evident in the, this is evident in the Torah and in the Old Testament. So this is something that Jews and Christians can't argue against, that God actually changes laws yeah. or adds to the laws that he had there's there's an inconsistency i mean there's it's consistent that the covenant is being established but god still maintains the freedoms the freedom to take out laws add laws adjust laws yeah and that's i think a, a topic that maybe people do try to argue about in religion that there's like an absolute perfect law but I think when you when you look at these covenants and you see that they're actually changing, uh, you see that the laws actually depend a lot on the the actions of the people and what has happened. And 
yeah, so there is, it's not an absolute perfect law, it's an ever-changing law. So now the jurisprudence and the laws that Noah came with, they continue to be practiced by all of the people of the earth. And there's no mention at all of any new covenant that takes place until we reach the story of Abraham. Yeah. And when we come to prophet Abraham, um, we find that God sends him forward uh, in a time period where actually the ruler was trying to kill uh, because he had seen in the stars or his advisors had seen in the stars that a messianic type figure was going to come that would threaten his rule. Uh, so they were already looking for him. They were slaughtering babies mm -hmm. and uh, he manages to survive. His mom hides him in a cave somewhere. Abraham grows at an extremely uh, fast rate. He's an extremely smart child. And he finally reaches the age of, of completion. And he goes forward as a prophet. And he speaks out against, uh, against the people that are worshipping uh, false idols. Um, and he's breaking the idols in the temple. And he's putting the axe in the hands of the, of the, uh, of the big idol. And he's contemplating and he's looking at the sun and he's telling the people, is this my God? And then he's saying, look how it sets. This can't be my God. What about the moon? Look how it sets. It can't be my God. Look at this star. Look at it. Because the people during that time period, they were worshiping the celestial bodies. They were worshiping idols. They were worshiping everything but God. So that means that from the time of Noah until we get the, to the time of Abraham, it's clear that the people weren't upon the same religion anymore as the religion of Noah. And they had appointed over them a king too. He was a great hunter of people. Uh, his name was Nimrod. Yeah. And Nimrod was basically trying to create a one world order. And he was building this great tower. Um, and what was the tower called? The tower of Babel. And what was his purpose? They wanted to kill God. They wanted to build a, a tower to, to into the sky so that they could fight. Exactly. The God, Bible yeah. says that they wanted to make a name for themselves. Human beings wanted to set themselves as supreme. They wanted to declare the supremacy of man. And they wanted to basically say that they were God. And so Abraham gets arrested. He's thrown into the fire. Yeah. The fire doesn't burn him. Yeah. Uh, God punishes Nimrod. And, and now there's no believers on the face of the earth except for Abraham. Yeah. And quite clearly, all of the covenant that was between God and mankind was broken. Yeah. Because they're not even recognizing, they don't even, they're not even aware that there was a covenant anymore. Yeah. And they're worshiping false gods. Mm -hmm. And rather they're trying to say that they're the ones who, they're the only ones who have a right to, to set their own laws and their own rules. Yeah. Okay? That, that's like the ultimate uh, going against the covenant. Which exactly. Is, yeah. So God brings down a punishment once again upon them. But the punishment now is different than the punishment that came down in the time of Noah. Because God promised Noah that he would never, um, you know, destroy the earth by a flood again. And he brings down a punishment, which is the confusion of languages. Yeah. And he scatters the nations. Yeah. So once they were all human, human, mankind was all united in evil. Uh, but they were united uh, and living under one government for the most part. And now they couldn't understand each other. And because of the language difference that struck them, and the, uh, they all started living independently as little tribes and nations, and, and that caused them to have conflicts eventually with one another. And, 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 and they, they kind of went backwards. Yeah. They regressed in their advancement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then God tells Abraham the exact same thing that he tells Noah. He says to him, the covenant, they broke it. 
and now I want to establish a new covenant with you. Yeah. And so now God's establishing a third covenant uh, with Abraham. He's saying, I'm choosing you above all people. I'm going to bless you. You are my friend. Yeah. I'm taking you as a friend and I'm granting you this land. And this land from the Nile to the Euphrates is... It belongs to you and your children. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Now, here is what I want you to do. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to abide by the slaughter uh, rules and sacrifices that I asked you to abide by before, your forefathers with Noah. And I want you to circumcise. So he adds circumcision to the equation. Yeah. Now uh, the third covenant becomes richer once again and different in its laws and in its jurisprudence to the second covenant. Yeah, so there's this addition. It's an addition. Yeah. yeah. And once again, Abraham is a prophet in Islam that is, that is considered to be one of the Ulil Azm prophets. Now what are these Ulil Azm prophets? It's basically Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad sallallahu yes. And the narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt say very clearly that a, an ulil azm prophet, a prophet of foremost determination, is one of the prophets that came with a new jurisprudence. Okay. Okay? Okay. So they're, they're not following the traditions, like they're, they're coming with something that the people would maybe fight them about? or they, they, come with, with, they come with their own jurisprudence. And some of the narrations even state that every prophet that was sent between one of the Ulil Azm prophets and another one, they would all be practicing and be upon the same jurisprudence as the Ulil Azm prophet that came before. So okay. between Noah and between Abraham, all of the prophets that were sent in between, um, the difference between them and between Noah is that Noah comes with something new. Yeah. He comes with new jurisprudence and then all of them are followers and practitioners and supporters and preachers of the jurisprudence of Noah. Okay. Once Abraham comes, Abraham nullifies. He says, it's gone, it's over, it's broken. God said that you guys broke the old covenant. So that covenant, whatever it contained, um, that is different to what I'm coming to you with, it's nullified, it's okay. done. Okay. And that's much more difficult. It is difficult. It, and that's why, what, that's why um, those prophets are so much more special than the normal prophets because the normal prophets, they come to the people while the people are already used to the things that they're saying. Yeah, right? it's tradition by that point. But an Ulil Azm prophet has to come with something that's new that the people are likely to reject. Yeah, okay. Okay? You get the idea? Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah. So Abraham, uh, he begins to be fruitful and multiply. The people are, his children are practicing circumcision and they're abiding by the rules of God until basically they go into Egypt, um, you know, in the time of Jacob and his children. Yeah. And then they leave in Egypt for a very long time. Uh, the Israelites uh, start to worship foreign gods. They pledge allegiance to the tyrannical pharaohs. Um, they abandon the prophets that were from the lineage of Joseph and Jacob. And uh, God's anger uh, comes upon them. Uh, for breaking the covenant. Yeah. And uh, basically, God uh, enslaves them for 400 years under Pharaoh yeah. for breaking God's covenant. Yeah. And God sends them a prophet who is unlike the rest of the prophets that came between uh, Abraham and Moses. And the prophet Moses yes. comes. He um, calls the people to, you know, a new jurisprudence after he leads them out of Egypt. God uh, calls Moses to the mount. He tells him, Moses, I'm establishing a new covenant with you and uh, I'm choosing you. And here is the rules to my covenant. And he brings down now the Ten Commandments, yes. which is vastly different uh, as it is. Uh, than the commandments which he gave to 
um, Abraham because now uh, do you know some of the commandments? Yeah, I mean, of course, there's the primary one that you you love God first, you you worship God, only God, the one God. But there's these other commandments that are a bit more, you know, specific, like you don't commit adultery, for example, you don't covet uh, your neighbor's possessions, things like this. They, they become more specific than the laws of the previous covenants. Exactly. And then in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Deuteronomy, and we see through the, uh, the, the, the story of Moses in those books that uh, in addition to those Ten Commandments, God lays out about yeah. uh, over 600, 600 yeah. uh, and 13 new commandments, also yeah. new ro- laws that he places that the Israelites have to abide by. Yeah. And so the reason why uh, the laws became so much more and they became extremely complex in the time of Moses is basically because in the time of Moses, he was leading a nation of 600,000 Israelites. I mean, that's uh, that's larger than, um, you know, that's that's about the size of, uh, that's the size of a very big nation yeah, that he's leading. it is. And they probably had many questions about how they have to live. And yeah, so so God gave them very specific instructions. And- Versus in the time of Abraham and in the time of Noah and in the time of Adam, each one of the first three covenants, uh, they start with um, just a, a man and his family so it's just in the beginning adam and eve and he gives them very basic rules right and then when it comes to the time of of noah once again it starts off as just noah with his family so they have basic rules yeah in the time of abraham it's just abraham and his family okay so it's basic rules yeah Uh, but now it's 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 very complex there's six hundred thousand individuals that each and every one of them has their problems and has their issues and has their questions that must be answered okay so it becomes a very complex, complex and and detailed uh, covenant. Yeah, that's a huge leap from it such basic instructions leap. to over six hundred uh, instructions. Yeah, it's so so many. And so Moses is the companion of the fourth covenant, and the Israelites continue to uphold and upkeep the covenant with Moses all the way until the time of Jesus and Jesus comes to them and Jesus begins to preach to them and Jesus was somebody that was foretold by Moses that he was going to come and Jesus could be seen as kind of like the the culmination of the law or the culmination of the covenant and even in one place in the bible um, jesus says i am the law yeah right yeah he does and so and so we find that the israelites in the time of jesus they reject him And three years into his dawah, they attempt to murder him. And Jesus was sent to them, not just as a prophet, but he was sent to them as a king, a second David. I want to pause right here, though, for a moment. And I want to state that sometimes you might find, like in the case of David, verses in the Bible where God is speaking to David and he says to him, I'm establishing a covenant with you, right? Mm -hmm. Are you aware of these verses? Yes, I know some people think that David had a covenant as well. Some people think that David had a covenant, but the reason why that it's not as you would think. Some people might argue that, okay, well then isn't this a new covenant altogether? And the answer is no. So God had a covenant with each and every one of his prophets. Mm-hmm. Uh, the narrations of the Ahl Bayt alayhi salam, they're very clear on this. Uh, and it is very clear also logically speaking that God would have a covenant with each and every one of his prophets. But when we go to look at what is the covenant that God had with David, we'll find that the covenant that God had with David is the exact same covenant that God had with Moses. 
So there's no difference there's no between the, the two. There's no terms, change yeah. in it. So David becomes the same as Solomon. He becomes the same as Zechariah, as Hosea, as Jeremiah, as all of the Israelite prophets that came between Moses and between Jesus. He wasn't a bearer of a new jurisprudence or a new covenant, but rather he was an upholder of the Mosaic covenant. Okay, I mean, that's clear because we see it's very clearly recorded when the jurisprudence is changed and God is always, uh, you know, all of the laws are, are in the scriptures. So had that been the case with David, it would have been clear. And then he but, would have came with new laws, but he didn't. Yeah. Uh, before David, they were practicing the Mosaic covenant laws. And after David, they're practicing the exact same thing. Okay. But then Jesus, interestingly, the next one, he was from the lineage of David. He was the, the king to come from. Yeah, he was the king to come. And he was supposed to become the second David, right? Mm -hmm. And the, he was the promised Messiah. And they totally turn against him. And they reject him. And they condemn him. And they choose their false uh, kings over him. And they basically crucify him. Yeah. And they sentence him to death. Yeah. Jesus is arrested after his betrayal. And the covenant between the Israelites and between God is broken. Because Jesus was supposed to come as a king. And he represented God. He represented the rule and the authority and the kingship of God. And by them rejecting Jesus... They rejected God Almighty as their king. Yeah. And it's like saying we don't admit and we don't recognize the covenant bringer. We don't recognize all of the Torah. Yeah. So them rejecting Jesus was the actual rejection of the entire covenant that took place. And this is... Yeah, there, you just, you're making me think about this verse that I, I really love. Like it's a parable of Jesus that... I, I've i read recently and I found it really relevant to, to the topic. You know, he basically said exactly what would happen. He told this parable, uh, the parable, it's called the parable of the tenants, where he's talking about uh, the owner of, of a vineyard. And um, the owner keeps sending people uh, to, to go and he, he gives the, the property to, to people to take care of it. And then he keeps sending people to go and uh, take it back, basically. And the people keep attacking the people that he keeps sending. And eventually, the the owner, the landowner, sends his son. And then the people even attack his son. And then he said, basically, uh, the whole thing is a metaphor for for how God is sending his prophets. And when they tried to kill them, and eventually they they did end up trying to to kill Jesus, he said. Uh, a warning. Therefore, I, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to another people who will produce its fruit. So basically, he was, and they knew, they knew that he was talking about them and they wanted to arrest him on the spot, but they were worried that he had supporters and that it would backlash on them. But he basically gave this warning that the covenant that you have, you're God's chosen people, but it's going to be taken away from you if you continue down this path trying to reject God by killing the messengers. So I, I, I love that parable, and I feel like it was extremely clear that, that he said, you're going to lose the covenant that God gave you, and it's going to be given to another people. And, uh, and that's basically what happened. So now something becomes extremely clear. Um, and we realize that, just like God said in the very beginning in the Quran, verily I'm making a caliph in the land. We realize that that there is part of this contract which must be upheld and it is obedience to the bringer of the covenant or the 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 divinely appointed uh, king or prophet or messenger in every time and every prophet and messenger anyway was a king that was uh, it was obligatory that they obey so whether they reject or break the laws of the covenant or they reject the bearer of the covenant or the messenger, it's the same thing. Rejecting the covenant or rejecting the messenger who's bringing the covenant, it yes, equals to the, the to the breaking of the covenant itself, okay, okay. right? Yeah. And 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 that's clear in the parable that that you um, that you uh, that you mentioned on the tongue of Jesus, alayhi salam, yeah. because the owner of the vineyard. Um, 
he sent his son to go forward to the vineyard, right? Yes. And even if the people who had taken over the vineyard, this rebellious group of workers that were on there that now wanted to take the vineyard for themselves, even if they continued to do the things which the the owner of the vineyard told them to do, even if they were continuing to plant seed and they were continuing to bring forward fruit from the ground yeah, and harvest it and, yeah. and taking care of the property with rejecting the messenger from the owner of the vineyard, the son, they broke the entire covenant and all of the rules and the laws that they were keeping uh, had no meaning and no point to it. And still, the, it's still the case today that there are people following, they think they're upon the covenant and they're following all the rules and the practices and stuff, but the covenant was broken the second that they rejected the messenger of God. Exactly. And that was the whole problem uh, and the whole reason why uh, Iblis or Satan was kicked out of paradise, right? Because um, he didn't reject God's laws or his jurisprudence, but what he did reject was he rejected Adam. Okay, yeah. so then Jesus, um, uh, he's crucified in the apparent amongst the people. And uh, Jesus, before that day, after the betrayal had had become evident, after Judas Iscariot, uh, it was clear that he already made his decision that he was going to um, betray Jesus. And Jesus sits for one final supper with his companions, and what takes place? He establishes. Yeah, he, a new he establishes the covenant, and uh, he he mentions it. He he mentions the word covenant specifically. Uh, there's the whole ritual of the Last Supper, the the eating of the the bread, the drinking of the wine. Um, this is the beginning of the establishment of the covenant, but it doesn't fully get to. And he gives them new commandments too. Jesus says to them, you know, I give you a new commandment, which is greater than all, and that's to love one another, all right? So now Jesus comes with a new commandment, and uh, the Jews, they reject it. A punishment comes down upon them for breaking the Mosaic covenant, and uh, the temple is destroyed, and the Jews are scattered. Meanwhile, Christianity begins to flourish in the Middle East and in different parts of the world. Um, immediately after Jesus's, after the crucifixion event, uh, Christianity does begin to flourish in the Middle East. It takes a couple hundred years for it to uh, really like flourish and settle in, in Europe. But immediately after, uh, there was kingdoms in, in Syria and other areas that were uh, all becoming uh, Christian. Yeah. And uh, so God's favor shifted from the Jews um, to the Arabs, from the children of Isaac to the children of Ismail, whom had accepted, the Arabs had accepted Jesus and they were upon his religion uh, in Egypt and in Syria and in all over the Middle East. Okay. Okay? Okay. Until there is sent to the Arabs a prophet. So now, after the breaking of the Mosaic Covenant, no more prophets are sent to Israel, and there's not even an Israel. Yeah, I mean... There's no Israel anymore. Yeah, it, they were scattered, they were, and the prophet, the prophet, the it's line of prophets which they had been consistently sent stopped. So it's, that, to me, is very clear that the covenant was clearly broken. Yeah, and given to another people, as you said, it it left them and then it picked up somewhere else. Somewhere else. Yeah. And we find that uh, while no more prophets were sent to Israel, that there was prophets that were sent to the Arabs. The Arabs yeah. um, and the greatest prophet of all time, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he appears amongst the Arabs uh, in a time where they had, after embracing Christianity, begun to go back to uh, a state of ignorance. They were worshipping sticks and stones, yeah. they were building idols once again, uh, they were rebelling, they were, uh, you know, there was widespread bloodshed and killing. Yeah. And then there was an army that was invading uh, Mecca, 
And God sends down his punishment upon them. He sends the birds that are carrying uh, stones and they stone all the people and they destroy them and it becomes the um, basically the events that Surah Al-Fil is talking about and um, Muhammad is sent. Okay. Okay. Muhammad now, what does he do? He, he establishes a new jurisprudence. Right? He establishes a new covenant and a new jurisprudence and he brings the Quran and in the Quran, God explicitly tells him, I'm establishing a covenant with you. Just as I have established with Noah and with Adam, with mm -hmm. Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with Jesus, I'm also establishing a covenant with you. And he becomes the companion of the sixth covenant. And his laws and his jurisprudence that he comes with are completely different than the covenant that Jesus came with yeah. and the covenant that Moses came with. Um, completely new laws. There's a month of Ramadan now where there's fasting. Yeah. There's five daily prayers. There's a new direction of worship. It shifts from Jerusalem and the Israelites, which is now destroyed, and there's no temple, and there's no Jerusalem, uh, there's no Israel, yeah. to uh, Mecca yeah. and the Kaaba. Yeah. And everybody who has, is part of, and has pledged allegiance to this new covenant that's with Muhammad sallallahu is considered to be um, people that are believers and people that are saved yeah. and the followers that of the previous covenants that reject Muhammad um, there's nothing from their practice of the old jurisprudence that can save them or help them well so again just empty practicing of a religion but if you're if you're not practicing the religion that's brought by the messenger of the time then it's th not worth then anything it's, yeah it's meaningless and so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he passes and the Arabs, they become like the Canaanites. They begin to slaughter the children and the family of the Prophet Muhammad. And they reject his divinely appointed successors. And they begin to do exactly as the previous nations did. And what happens? They, they, they also tried to to kill, um, and they did successfully kill all of the divinely appointed caliphs after Muhammad, all, the, all of the imams, and, and then they tried to kill the twelfth imam, and they've been in this big, long state of confusion and misguidance, right, for the past over a thousand years. Yes. Until. It came to our modern day today. And in 1999, there was sent a messenger from Imam Mahdi. And one of Imam Mahdi's names is Baqayatullah, the remnant of God. He's the final part of the, of the message of God, the final successor from the Imams to Muhammad. He's the, he's the last remaining part of monotheism, the last letter in La ilaha illallah. And he sends a messenger who is Ahmed Hassan to Iraq at a time that was right before the invasion of the Americans. And he gave a prophecy. He told the people that Saddam Hussein was going to fall and that it was his destruction because he had, as a punishment, because he was rewriting like Nimrod the Quran in his blood. And indeed, uh, after the invasion, Saddam Hussein was removed from power and the Americans came in with their system, which we spoke about democracy and how yeah. that's the system of the Antichrist. Yeah. 
right, the supremacy of God, because the system of democracy and elections and people choosing their leader does not leave any room for God to be the one who appoints uh, the ruler. Yeah. And all of the scholars, just like the rabbis in the time of the Roman occupation, in the time of Jesus of Jerusalem, all of the Muslim scholars during this Roman American occupation of Iraq um, began to call towards elections yeah. and call towards democracy. In fact, every single Muslim scholar on the face of the entire planet was advocating for democracy or for some sort of system whereby people appoint their own leader. I mean, that's really surprising because these are the people who claim to be wanting Imam Mahdi even to the come. Taliban, Even the Taliban and people that are extremists like this, they had their own systems of them choosing the most knowledgeable of their scholars or the most noble of their tribesmen and appointing them to be caliphs in Ashura uh, over their, their Muslim state. The only person who is saying that it is only the right of God to appoint the leader, and he has to appoint the leader through, um, you know, through a will, was Ahmed al-Hassan the only one. He was the only one. And the response that the government gave to Ahmed al-Hassan and the people at that time was rejection. And the scholars issued fatwas calling for his murder and for his killing. And Ahmed al-Hassan ended up being chased down after there was many attempts on his life. And he went into a state of hiding or he withdrew from the public eye. Oh. And it was then that the covenant was totally, completely broken. Oh, wow. And a new covenant was established during the, the life of Ahmed al-Hassan he, did, he he went to the to the very people that should have welcomed him to to the Arabs, right? To the Muslims, to the nation of Prophet Muhammad, and then they they did that to him. They did that to him. It's understandable that that would be like the nail in the coffin of the the covenant. It's done at that point. And so a seventh covenant was established, and that's what we're calling the people towards today: a new covenant, which was pretty much foretold in the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt because they talked about how in the time of the Mahdi um, nothing would remain of Islam, of Islam except for its name yeah. and nothing would remain of the Quran except for its drawing. Um, people would be called Muslims but they were the furthest thing from it. Uh, the scholars would be the greatest enemies of Imam Mahdi. Imam Mahdi would be coming with a new ruling and he would be coming with a new Islam and he would be uh, taking people back to something which was forgotten. He'd be spreading 27 letters of knowledge while all before there was only two letters that were sent. The narrations of the Ahlul Bayt are also clear that when the cotton comes, he rules by the rule of David and he rules by the rule of Adam and he rules by the rules of Muhammad and previous prophets and messengers. So there's changes that are taking place in the jurisprudence. There's narrations that mention that the people are actually objecting to um, the cotton because of that very fact, because of the fact that uh, he's doing things and practicing things that are unfamiliar to them and they think that he's going against the law uh, of what they were taught before. Yeah. And that's where we're at today. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it makes sense, all of the story from the very beginning with Prophet Adam uh, the the covenant with Prophet Adam. All all this story was leading up to this this moment. Um, yeah, I, it makes sense. And there's been so many narrations, as you mentioned, talking about how 
the jurisprudence will change and there will be a new matter and the calm is calling to a new matter and it, it will look like something different. And how could that be if it was not the establishment of a, of a new covenant? Uh, I think that I've never heard the story of mankind put in this way, except uh, by you. Uh, you made it extremely clear how this has actually been the story of mankind with God from the very beginning. It's just been this series of covenants and uh, unfortunately a series of failures uh, of humanity to uphold the covenant. And so a new covenant had to be established time and time again. And it's it's shocking that we are living in the time of, of this final covenant, the final offering of God to mankind. Um, okay. And so it is this final covenant where God sends forward the Mahdi and he sends them to call people back towards towards the word of God. We mentioned how a punishment came down with the breaking of each and every one of the covenants. And the narrations state that in the time of the Qa'im, it is actually the Qa'im and his companions who are the punishment upon the people of the earth. Yeah. So in the time of the Mahdi, the Qa'im and his companions are sent as a flood. They're sent as a confusion and a scattering of nations. Uh, they're sent as a punishment that would come down upon the nation of Muhammad sallallahu to take revenge for the slaughtering that had taken place against his household unless they repent wow. and go back to the supremacy of God and go back to the upholding of the covenant between God and mankind. Wow. And so it's a, it's, a very, it's a very important time period uh, that we're living here because we're living at the moment of the establishment and calling towards the newest and the, the last, the final, the seventh covenant between God and mankind and between uh, the punishment that is deserving and about to fall down on humanity because of the breaking of the sixth covenant. And so we're in that final hour where Noah is calling the people uh, to board the, the ark yeah. uh, before the flood hits. Yeah. Because the hit is uh, sudden, right? The... It is sudden. Yeah. I think we'll stop there. And uh, thank you so much, Tiffany, for joining us. Thank and you so uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance for everyone on the face of the earth. Yeah. I, I, I pray that people take into account all of these stories that were left as a warning and don't be like the people who are following an empty religion and they think that they're upon the truth and they're just shocked by the swift appearance of the punishment. Um, thank you so much for having me here and uh, I really appreciated everything that we learned today. It's such a fascinating topic. And thank I, you. I can't wait to learn more soon. <laughs>